Okay, good morning. This is Jay Waters. I'm with the Americans in Wartime Museum, and I've got Mr. Ralph Dinnan here this morning. We're in Toms River, New Jersey. Today is 29 October 2018, but uh, Mr. Dinnan, if you would, just please give us your, your full name, place of birth, and date of birth, please. Ralph I. Dinnan. Date of birth is Brooklyn, New York. And what war and what war did you participate in? World War II. And looking back at, at families or brothers and sisters, did you have any uh, relatives that had served in the military? Yeah, my brother was in World War II. With the uh, army or? He was in a medical service corps. Okay. He was a dentist. Okay, the dentist. That we... Yeah. Where did, uh, where did he serve, do you know? <clears throat> he served on uh, army troop ships uh, as a medical officer. Okay. And then looking back to the World War II time, think about December 7th, 1941. Where were you that day? And can you kind of tell us a little bit about what happened that day for you? 41. I guess I was um, about 17 years old. I was just graduated high school. And uh, I remember hearing about it. In fact, I was on a, a bicycle trip with some other guys. And I just heard about it. and. Uh, you know, uh, being 17, I didn't think much about it. I was wondering what I was going to do with my life. Right. Okay. And and why why did why and how did you enter the military service? I was drafted in 1943, February. Okay. <clears throat> and if you would, then just kind of tell us a little bit about the uh, induction process and where you went for initial training. I think I was inducted in, uh, in Manhattan, New York, and my initial training was three days in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. First day I got there, they put me on 24-hour KP. <laughs> Welcome to the Army. Right? <laughs> okay. Where did you get any other training besides the time at Fort Dix? Uh, well, after that KP, I went next. I went to my tent to sleep, and they said, uh, "Pack up. We're going to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, okay. to form a new new tank battalion." And that was by train. Okay, and then just tell us a little bit about the training that you did at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Oh, it was um, you know we had uh, every morning get up for physical training, and then we trained in uh, in tanks. I trained as a I guess they trained us in all aspects of the tank, but then I became mostly a tank driver for the 701st Tank Battalion. It was a completely new tank battalion. There was a cadre waiting for us. Uh, it was made up mostly of uh, uh, New York, New Jersey boys. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what kind of tanks were you guys working on? Uh, it was a Grant, Grant tank. And you were a, a driver? That was my training, and I was a driver. Yeah. Then, uh, about a few months later, they uh, they must have checked my records, and they needed somebody in headquarters. So I had some college by that time, and the Army test gave me a high IQ. So I went into the uh, they put me into the in, into headquarters, which I was kind of uh, didn't particularly care about it because I felt like. I was, it wasn't the army, you know, but uh, my mother said, if they put you there, you stay there. What kind of things were you doing in the headquarters part? I was uh, like a corporal, a company clerk, um, did reports, uh, worked on uh, statistics, uh, ordered help order uh, uh, equipment and so forth. And, and you said you, you were a corporal now? At that so time. So you've been promoted a couple yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good, good. Well, so then after training was completed at Fort Knox, did you guys have any additional training or was it time to start shipping out? Oh, then we also went to Camp Campbell. Okay. Which is in Kentucky. Yeah. And, uh, and then at that time, <clears throat> they decided to make us a special unit. And we had, at that time it was called, it was a secret, a secret uh, operation. And I guess you can talk about it now. They had some kind of a arc light where the tank, turret of the tank was, and supposedly it was so strong that it would, buy, it would blind um, the enemy infantry. 
So from there we went to uh, uh, Arizona desert, California oh, wow. desert, Boise, uh, uh, Arizona, California. I went there by train and lived in tents. And we worked mostly at night, and the English were there too. Oh wow! UK troops. We worked at night and slept in a and uh, slept in the daytime. Right? And um, they worked on that. And then in April, in April of '44, we went over to Europe. And in Europe, we worked with the English with the same type of equipment. Worked at night. Wound up in Wales. And. Uh, we were in Wales, and by this time D-Day had happened, but they never called us. And that was, uh, and then in August, we were supposed to go over to Europe, across the channel, and I had pneumonia all of a sudden. They put me in the hospital. My outfit went to 701st, went across, which of course I wasn't happy about. About 10 days in the hospital, I came out, worried they were going to put me into infantry which I never had training. But luckily, the 740th tank was still in, in Wales, which is a, a same type of a separate tank battalion. And they put me in headquarters there, and that's where I stayed the whole, whole time. So in another headquarters unit, yeah. but a, a, an, an identical tank battalion, though, it sounds exactly. like. Exactly, a separate tank to the battalion. They had three, 701, 702, and 7 something, sure. then 740, 71st, and so forth. Yeah. So d did you, the but channel. I have to explain the 740th made up of all Oklahoma, oh. Texas boys okay. who knew how to shoot guns. I mean, the 701st, nobody knew how to shoot a gun until the army taught us. Yeah, that's right, because before you were with the New York and New Jersey guys. Yeah, what I was with it? The Texans. two New Yorkers, me and another fellow. Oklahoma and uh, right. the Texans. It was a new world. Just going back for a second to crossing. To, uh, to Wales, was it by, I'm assuming it was by ship? And yeah. Could you just talk a little bit like how long it took and what it was like being no, on we the went, ships? I think we went first to uh, Scotland, I think, and then we went to Le Havre in France, oh, I remember that. And, uh, and then we were in British, in British uh, 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 places of, of uh, practice, and then from there we went to Wales and lived in tents. And, the reason I got pneumonia it was raining and cold, and it was miserable weather. And uh, I had 104 temperature, so I went. The guy says, "You'll go in the hospital." Right? Yeah, that's pretty significant. Pretty serious. Yeah. Did anything stand out though when you crossed the Atlantic? Was there still uh, the threat of the German submarines? Oh yeah, we that? went on a Mauritania, which oh, was okay. a yeah. big ship, that 15,000 of us on it, and we lived five bunks, one on top of the other. And I never felt well, but I never got sick. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of people on the, right, on yeah. the ship. How, was, long, how long a trip was it on I the ship? I think it was remember? about three or four days. Yeah. Oh, it was pretty and, quick. Yeah, and being, we, being a big ship like that, we were alone. We didn't have any, they crisscross, and we were fast enough where uh, we went without uh, having support to protect us. Okay, okay. That's what they told us. Yeah. Well, so then it's, it sounds like it's now after... August, September 1944, you're with the 740th. This is in August, I'm now in the uh, 740th. 740th right. is August. Right. Um, doing the same type of uh, work at night and then sleeping in the daytime. Right? But now have you gone, have you crossed over with them to France yet? Yeah, we went over in, um, in uh, let's see, it was in October. Okay, and it sounded like, did you go into uh, La Havre? Um, or I think it was uh, one of the uh, one of the places where the D-Day battles took place. But it was, you know, it was okay. Was well, it? One of the it ports because you had yeah. you had all your equipment probably yeah, too, right? Right. It was so. uh, it was this junior. It was four months after D-Day. Sure. Right? Anything stand out about that arriving in the port and forming back up with your equipment? And I guess all I know is it, it being. I was in. A, I guess I was in a um, in a six by six truck by that time, and well, I know we were driving and driving and driving, and that's all. And actually, the seven fourth, we went. All that battle had been before us, so we went through Paris like a like a bat out of hell, and went up. And then our biggest battle actually wasn't a battle of bows. That was the first big battle. 
Well, then let's let's talk about that. What do you remember of, of how it started and, and how it affected you and your, your, your group of people? The Battle of Bulge was supposed to be a almost rest and recreation, and our tank battalion had no usable tanks ready. Wow. They were all in, in the depot. And uh, when the attack by the Germans came, uh, the tank commanders went into the depot and they scrounged 12 tanks, parts, anti-tank guns too, and big guns. And uh, that's what they used. And uh, now luckily, uh, as I said, these kids were sharpshooters. And the tank seven fourth had Colonel Rubel, and he was um, he was a very he uh, really um, trained the fellows great. He trained us great. We were we prepared for everything. Well, so this was December of 1944, correct? Yeah. And and uh, I've always read. I heard it was it was very cold. What do you what do you remember? Right. It was <laughs> it was 20 degrees and and below, and uh, it started out very cold, then began to snow, and the Germans had white jackets and white uniforms, and we had green jack green uniforms, so we stood out. Uh, didn't have proper shoes or socks, so. Um, uh, it, the amount, there were 19,000 American soldiers killed and, uh, let's see, 80,000 and 60,000 wounded or taken prisoner in, from January 16th, December 15th to January 16th of 45. Well, so you, you mentioned about the depot. They were able to get a, get a certain number of tanks out. Yeah, and right, uh, right. Did you go out with one of the tanks? or? or no, I was in headquarters. So, yeah. at the headquarters. so being in a battalion, you're always right behind the tanks. Right. You're, not, you're not far back. So most of our work was done in, in a big, I think it was six by six trucks. Uh, or we're lucky we had a tent. Or very lucky sometimes you get a, a house or something. Sure, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But uh, we... If I was in a division, I'd be way back. So you always worried about snipers and worried about mortar guns and worried about uh, shell fragments sure. and stuff like that. And did you in the, the headquarters section, did you run into any, any German contact? No. No. We weren't. We were. The, the tanks probably a right. little bit ahead, though. Right. We're, yeah. we're doing some of the fighting. Yeah. Did you run into any German prisoners or? Oh, or? yes. Well, on VE Day, May 8th, when we were going north, they were just walking south by the thousands with their hands up, right? right. And then we met the, um, uh, well, during the Battle of the Bulge, our company, not being attached to the division, was pulled apart. So uh, our battalion, one company would go to this division, another company would go to that division. And of course, as I said before, the, uh, the biggest battle they had was against uh, SS Panzer Division by Colonel Piper, who was the same colonel who, uh, Kill the American troops at Malmody. Yeah, well, can you tell us a little bit about that? What you remember, or how, how you how you found out about that? Right. Yeah. Well, they, we lost them. I, I, the guys were such. Of course, they were big tanks, and if we met them head on, there was no way we we're going to hit them. And luckily, our tanks being had a 75 or 76 millimeter, they had 88. So the way to beat them was to uh, hit them on the side, knock out their uh, treads, or Believe it or not, these guys were good shooters that they were able to put the shells down the muzzle of the 88. Wow. And that, of course, exploded. Yeah. Wow. So they were able to stop the Panzer, and I think they wound up with 100, the Panzer Division wound up with 100 guys alive. And unfortunately, Colonel Piper was alive too. And they just, and they were trying to get to Liege and then to Antwerp, because in Antwerp they had a uh, supply of uh, oil. And that was the only way they can keep going. So, since our 7th was very instrumental in stopping them, uh, we felt very proud of that. And at that time, we were attached to, mostly to the 82nd Airborne. Okay. Yeah. And uh, two and three of our companies got the uh, presidential unit citation, and the 82nd Airborne put a um, proclamation out that we were allowed to put their patch on, okay. right, on our arm. So we had um, uh, armor patch here, and uh, on the right side we had the uh, 82nd Armour. Yeah, uh, uh, very, which, uh, very which famous a, division. Yeah, which was an honor. Yeah. Mm, yeah, and I think the 82nd was a reserve, uh, not not a reserve, but was held in reserve, and during the battle. Yeah, they won. The they they first was in, ba in in the Bastogne, mm -hmm. and they got surrounded. Right. We were further uh, north or west. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
What What do you remember? How, how did you find out about the uh, the, the Malmö Day massacre? Oh, we heard about it. Yeah. Just just through uh, yeah. every reports and stuff. <laughs> spread through the troops like crazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I had heard from the Battle of the Bulge too. Maybe maybe you had seen this or heard about it. The um, uh, German like special operatives were dressed as American soldiers yeah. and. Mm -hmm. Changing directions of the signs for the directions for the road. Yeah, even though even though I was in headquarters, they were running ashore as troops, so I was on guard duty. And I remember we had to stop jeeps and ask them, American who was a Babe Ruth, or ask them American uh, American things they should know. And of course, all of them, most of the Germans were had uh, education in in America, so they spoke English very well with that German accent. That was like a scary night. And then they changed all the signs. So if you want to go to St. Vith, it was west, they put it east. And, yeah. and the roads were all clogged up because of it. Yeah. I always wondered if, it, did you ever have anybody though who maybe just didn't know American baseball <laughs> and it's an American soldier? Not, not, that, I, not that I stopped, no. So, so there were no, uh, no. no problems. There must have been some, but I didn't stop. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, okay. Did, um, did you have any of your friends or, or buddies get, get wounded or killed during the, the battles there? Well, of course, I knew, I knew most of the guys in the tanks, but uh, we, at, at that time I was in headquarters, I didn't ever get close to any of them, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially since I was, I came in afterwards, you right, know? Right, right. So, uh, as I said, just me and another guy was a New Yorker. The other guy was 35 years old was considered, what the hell are you doing here, a grandpa, you know? And they put him in, they put him in the supply, I think. Okay. And I was, I went in, I was 19 and a half, so this time I was 20 and a half, right? So I, I blended in with the other, with the other kids. What worried me is, there was another fellow in my company called, the name was Dinan, D-I-N-N-I-N, and I had one N, James Dinan. I always worried if we were, if one of us was killed, and there wasn't a, a mess to screw up, you know? Right. Also, I, I'm Jewish, so I know I didn't ever want to be caught and be a prisoner. Sure. Because yeah. I think yeah. I'd be trouble. Mm. Did you ever do any of the, in the headquarters, were you responsible for any of the administrative, like the casualty reports, no, or any yeah. of that stuff? Yeah. Could you just right. tell us a little bit about how that process worked? Oh, yeah. Well, I think the uh, company the uh, company commander sent in a casualty report, and then we had to write them up and submit them to the first sergeant. Uh, t eventually, I became a um, technical uh, technical sergeant, which was a uh, I was in charge of uh, of uh, personnel. So eventually, from there, I went to the uh, the uh, first sergeant. Master sergeant was in maintenance. The first sergeant was under the captain in charge of the company. Well, and it sounds like you got promoted a couple of times. Anything stand out about yeah, any of the promotions? Yeah, I went from corporal to sergeant to uh, staff sergeant, and then towards the end, a technical sergeant. But all in a pretty quick period of time. Uh, no, it, actually, uh, let me see. I got the staff and the, and, the st and the tech went fast because by that time, uh, it was getting towards the end of the war, and a lot of guys were going home. Right. So they had that point system, you know. Well, you must have been doing pretty well, though, doing something right yeah. to get promoted. Yeah. How did, uh, during, when you were in, in, when you were deployed, how did you stay in contact with, uh, with family or friends back in the United States? Oh, we wrote letters. Yeah. That's the only way. They called it, a, what do you call it? Some kind of a mail. Was it the, the V-mail? V-mail, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, what do you remember about that? Well, we'd write that. In fact, uh, when I came home, my parents saved <laughs> okay. most of the letters. Yeah. And, I, and then we threw them out, and I'm sorry we threw them out. I said it would have been very interesting. Yeah, weren't they on like a yeah, microfiche it was, almost? It was a single sheet, right? And then it kind of, you wrote on it and it kind of folded over. Okay. Right? And kind of kind of sealed itself, yeah. And then what was it like getting mail from the from the States? Oh, that was great, yeah. I, they, they had the mail clerk and uh, that was one of the highlights of the of the day when we got it, right? Yeah. 
Did you get packages too, yep. or was it recent? Yeah. Okay. Any any special packages? Stand yeah, out send a, foods or? send a salami to the boy in the army. That yeah. was a slow. Okay, I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> and even though I wasn't smoking cigarettes, my folks played black market back home to buy cigarettes, and they sent it to me. Okay. And actually, I started smoking cigarettes. Oh, did you? And they gave away a lot, but uh, I didn't become addicted to it. And the funny thing, uh, uh, after the war. Well, VE Day, I continue with VE Day, and that was uh, May 8th. We were in, uh, traveling uh, north, and we hit the Elbe River. And at the Elbe, Elbe River, we, at the ELBE, we met the uh, Russian troops. Okay. And I have some pictures home with me and some Russian officer and an enlisted man, three of us in a picture. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, we went on to the Lord Pocket. When we went through the Six Feet Line twice, I don't know where it was, but I know and from then on we had to continue fighting till May 8th when it was all over. And then, um, then we, we did occupation from, uh, from May 8th till January. And occupation was great, you know. You didn't have much duty, you can have movies and all that, but right. you still had to be careful of snipers. Some guys just, Germans just didn't want to give up. So you had to be careful where you when you went into the cities and walked around. Yeah, wh where were you for the occupation oh, duties? Or? I think one town was Schwerin, I think. S-T-H-W-E-R-I-N, I believe. But right. they were moving you around a little bit. Um, Sounds like you might. A couple of towns, yeah. And I know like the company commander would be, he'd become the mayor of the town. And then, they, and then um, when our men started going home, we were, we were, uh, we had uh, Japanese-American boys come in because they couldn't send them to Japan because the war was still on there. So they sent it to us for, uh, to fill up our tank battalion. So we had a lot of Yomamoto's and Hirohodas in our, in our uh, battalion, which was good. They were young kids, you know. Yeah. Yeah. What was the interaction like with, you mentioned some of the, the snipers, German snipers, the diehards, but like the average German people, like the women or the children or the older men that were- Oh, nobody, nobody was a Nazi. <laughs> they all, they all said they had to do what they did, you know, and uh, well, and we tried to get the get the electricity going and and get the city back in uh, uh, normal as best we can. You know, that's America, right? Right. We try to bring the rest of the world up to snuff. I would imagine the destruction was pretty pretty massive, though. A lot of those yeah. towns and cities. Oh, yeah, some of them were. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any interaction with the local Germans, though? Yeah, you know, yeah. Like you get some time off, you you meet the girls, or you talk to some families, but mostly you go out with two or three other buddies, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, can I go back on something? Uh, absolutely. About I remember uh, we were in a desert, Arizona desert, and we were working on a secret project. So we went into uh, into Phoenix, Arizona, mm -hmm. on a weekend, but we had to go five at a time because I didn't want anybody to mention what we were doing. So. Uh, and uh, for anything, I have a book written by my colonel right after the war, and he didn't mention what the secret thing was. So I guess in forty, in uh, forty-six, it was still classified. Okay. Anything stand out about your trip to Phoenix? Yes, nineteen forty. Let's see, forty-five, forty-six. I thought it was the cleanest, whitest town I had ever seen. It was amazing. I understand it's different now. You have, you, have you been back? No. 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 But it's the cleanest, whitest town. Gee. Yeah. Especially... It's, I, and I, I've been there a couple of years ago. It's pretty nice. Pretty of course, nice in the Arizona, we were living in big desert. Right. In, in tents, too. Yeah. So it was tent city. And the uh, funny thing, I think at times we ate better in combat than we did at the Arizona desert. Wow. Because they were giving us uh, rations like we would have in New sure. York. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, you mentioned the, the arc light uh, program that you guys were using. Did, did it ever get further developed? Did you ever use it? I understand. I can't ver verify. I understand that the, the power was, was reduced, and they used it on the Rhine River to help the engineers at night to build the uh, bridges across the river, pontoon bridges. I mean, that's what I heard, but I don't know. So it almost sounds like it was used more like just additional lighting yeah. versus as a weapon yeah. weaponization. The theory was that there'd be a series of tanks with these arc lights 
behind the uh, opposite uh, infantry, our infantry can go and wipe them out. But I think they decided that if the enemy was at the right-hand side, they would, they would see our lights and wipe us out. I yeah. think that was my theory. I don't know. Well, maybe it's almost... But all I know is it saved me from D-Day, because we were in Europe, in Wales in April. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Which was a terrible thing. Um, sometimes folks talk about USO shows or entertainment things that were going on during World War II. Did you, did you get to I never saw one. No, I never got to saw one. Even though reading my colonel's book, he said there was one schedule. By the time he and a group went there, they had the wrong time. They told him it would be 3 o'clock and it was 11 o'clock. But I had never heard of it, no. I never, okay. saw, never saw Bob Hope or anybody else. What kind of things did you guys do, though, to, to, when you had some free time? Um, were there any kind of sports or card games or...? or? Uh, with this, well, I remember in, in Wales, uh, the uh, Red Cross had, uh, we went to a, 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 a uh, uh, it was like a beach area called Tenby, Wales. Tenby, Wales, and we'd have the weekend off there and go there. And they had great, um, USO had great uh, facilities and they put us up for the night and they'd give us food and they had dances with the local girls. Okay. So that was good. Yeah. yeah. Well, other than what we've, we've talked about already, are there any other incidents that stand out to you that were either like very frightening or, or very exciting, anything unusual? <laughs> I have to say, I must, I never was any, I never was on Boy Scouts, okay? So we're here, we were having a bivouac someplace and it was up on a hill. So we were in sleeping, sleeping bag. So I, I put the bag down in the middle of the night. I'm dead tired and I'm in a bag and suddenly the rain starts and I'm, I'm on the bottom of the hill and the water is done oh. running right into, my, right into my sleeping bag. That's how good a boy scout I was, right? <laughs> wow. The, um, you mentioned the presidential unit, unit citation that your battalion got. Were there any other? Uh, two, uh, two companies got it. Right? Okay. Okay. Were there any other awards that either you got individually or that your units got? Uh, no, well, I, I got three battle stars for the, what would they call it, the uh, European, Middle East, and... Yeah, probably the Europe, the, well, the campaign, campaign, the European yeah. theater campaign right. with the three battle stars. Right. Okay. Yeah, so the three battle stars would have been Battle of the Bulge. Do you know what the other two? Yeah, Normandy. Okay. And uh, what was the other one for, Normandy? The one before that, I guess, I, I don't remember. Or maybe uh, the Ard was there a separate one for the Ardennes campaign? Or just liberation no, of Germany, maybe? Or yeah, liberation no, of France? No, three separate, I don't remember the other Yeah, two. okay. okay. And then I got a certificate, as I wrote, I got a certificate of commendation from, uh, from France for being in the Battle of Normandy. Okay, yeah. from the French government? Yeah. 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 Was, there a, uh, was there a ceremony when you got that? No, or no. They just, just sent it. Actually, they sent it in the mail after I came home. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that must have been nice to yeah. get that. Yeah. Okay. And well, I had a good conduct. Then I had a, uh, I think I wrote that down, uh, a sharpshooter medal for the Tommy gun. Tommy gun, I don't even remember. You th that was in basic training, I guess, because I remember we had a carbine and then a pistol, but I guess we must have been training on a car on a Tommy gun. I say I guess I could be a good mafia guy or something. Yeah, you must. Right. You must have done well on the right. uh, on the Tommy gun. And then you also mentioned um, the meritorious um, meritorious service medal. Yeah, yeah. They gave that out. Too. That's good. That's good. And there was a victory medal, but everybody got that. Sure, yeah. sure. But you were there. Yeah. Um, well, so speaking of homecoming, can you kind of describe, you know, you finished occupation duty, it sounds like in January of 1946. Yeah. And then the, the, the sending home and the demobilization yeah, process. Yeah, I had 63 points by the time they sent me home on a Liberty, Liberty ship. It took about 10 days. We, we went to uh, Manhattan. And then I went back to, uh, I think I went back to Fort Dix. Okay. Right? And then we were there a couple of days. And then I got my... Uh, discharge, and I must have got on some train, I was living in Brooklyn then, my parents were, to go back home 
and I, I was on a train with a duffel bag, <laughs> and some woman gets gets up and gives me a seat. So I said, I said I must have looked bad, or she was very patriotic. I don't know which. And then when I got home, I took a um, from the so I came home on the subway, took a cab to my house. Lived in an apartment house in Brooklyn. That okay. Time. And I remember I got in a cab. Uh, I'm gonna get teared up in this. I always do, so, yeah. It was good. Did that, did they know you were coming, or did you surprise yeah. people? No, I think my parents knew by this time I was coming. Yeah, maybe you yeah. could have called them at yeah. that point, too. I know yeah. somebody from the sixth floor yelled out, welcome home, you know. Yeah, that's good. And that's good. when I see these these guys coming home now from Iraq and Afghanistan on TV, I still tear up. Yeah, no, that's good. And, and you were in uniform, it sounds like, too, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, you probably didn't have any no. civilian clothes to... Mm -hmm. To put on. I didn't get any clothes till uh, about a month later. Where my I had an older sister, she she went out and bought me my my clothes. Okay, uh, your sister did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you think your 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 wartime experience affected you later in life? And, and and could you tell us a little bit about what you did after the military? Well, I had some college before military. So then, uh, about almost two months later, I went back to uh, college. I went to Brooklyn College, and had. Um, had two years of college there, and then I went to Boston, Massachusetts, and went into uh, four years of uh, New England College of Optometry. And I was, I graduated in 1950, married in 1949. And we stayed, we went up to Boston for a year, and then I opened my office in Verona, New Jersey in 1951. Stayed there for 42 years. Wow. And then I came to, uh, Tom's River, New Jersey. Hmm. That's great. We married. Uh, we married 67 years. Well, congratulations. Yeah, well, that's good. I have a son, a daughter, four grandchildren, and three great grandchildren. Hmm. Well, and so when we were talking about uh, your time in Germany, you know, during during the war, did you get any? Um, leave? Because it sounds like you were there for multiple years. Did you get any, um, even R&R, &R, like oh, within yeah, Europe? Yeah, yes, yes. I was tell in, us about that. I was in, they sent us to Switzerland for a week. Okay. And in Switzerland, I was there August, when we dropped the, uh, the atom bomb in Japan. So I was there, so uh, uh, theoretically the war was over. So some Swiss citizen came up to me and he gave me a pack of cool cigarettes. That was the best thing he could do. And, sh and shook my hand. It was ironic, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, it was, that was fun. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought we were doing R&R uh, &R in Switzerland. Do, do you remember where you were in Switzerland? Oh yeah, I was in, uh, I was in the, in the Alps. Okay. Really high up, yeah. And what time of year was it, do you know? Uh, August. So, oh, wow. That's when the, drop, when the bomb yeah, was Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. It was exactly. August, exactly. that's the same week. Right. But perfect, perfect weather probably too. Oh yeah, it was beautiful, right? And um, I hate to say it, but I guess one night we went out and we drank too much and um, we didn't pay attention what hotel we were in. And I forgot the name of the hotel and finally some MP was able to tell me where I, where I should, be, should be. I remember that. And, it's, and we got, uh, we, we were given $30 to go in Switzerland because they didn't want us to mess up the Swiss uh, financial system because they were neutral, you know? Right. So I bought a eBell watch for $25, which I still have. Oh, wow. And eBell now sells in the hundreds and thousands of dollars. Yeah. And I had $5 left for entertainment, but we met a lot of nice girls and they uh, supplied the rest of the money and food and all that. Yeah. Right, right. They were good to the souls. Okay. Well, we're winding down to just a couple more questions. Yeah. And you mentioned your, your wife and, and, and family and kids and grandkids. If, if there was just one thing though, that you would want grandkids and future generations to know about you and your, your military service, what would that be? Uh, I actually was a good soldier, uh, industrious, tried my best. And uh, of course, now that I'm older, for many years I didn't think about it at all. 
I actually began to think about it when I moved to Tom River and there was a veterans club and that made me think about it. But I really should have talked about it more. For example, I don't know what my brother did except that he was on a troop ship. Never right. even discussed it, right. which is terrible. But my son, I started talking about it more. And then there's a, there's a Battle of the Bulge organization nationwide. So uh, last month, he actually uh, sent an article about me to the Battle of the Bulge organization, and it was published in the, in the um, we get a quarterly bulletin right. magazine. And when I showed it to one of the fellows here, he had that put into a, a local Lake Ridge paper. Yeah. So two months ago, I became a celebrity here. Yeah, I think my, my dad told me about that. Yeah, yeah. that was good. That was nice. Yeah. Well, good. And some fellows said it was such a nice article. They thought they thought it was my obituary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't want don't want that. No, don't so that was that. Uh, very nice. Yeah. Well, that's great. Is there is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or record or? Did, more detail on anything else that we... Sometimes I think I would have, I, I would have been, I was disappointed going to headquarters. I think I would have been, would have liked to have more action in a tank, but they, t they tell you where to go and you have no choice, as you know, right? Right. So that's it. Hmm. Well, you did what you were asked to do and... Uh, I was told to do it. I wasn't told to do, asked right, to do, right. and uh, you did very well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, did, I think I was a, I was very good in headquarters, right? Well, I would like to, as we as we wind up, present you one of our museum challenge coins. Oh, That's from the you. National Museum of Americans in Wartime, and uh, maybe just hold it up to the camera for a quick second. But uh, yeah, and uh, thank you again. This thank is always you. a pleasure for me right. to meet meet all veterans, but World War II veterans, obviously, are nice to talk to you. Very special for what they, what you guys did.